Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome into a teacher of history of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that James Madison dedicated over 40 years of his life in service to our country, only to retire pretty quietly in 1816, not really to be heard of publicly in any significant way again, at least in national politics? And that by the end of James Madison's presidency, his Secretary of State James Monroe, in the eyes of many politicians and citizens, was probably more respected than Madison was, and viewed by some to be the sort of acting commander-in-chief of the United States military. And that James Monroe won in one of the biggest landslides in presidential election history in 1816, partially because his primary competitor bowed out in deference to Monroe's popularity and presidential resume. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 110, Introducing President James Monroe. All right, everyone, welcome in to... Unit 5 of A Teacher's History of the United States podcast. Uh, I'm really excited for it. I sort of gave a um, preview of it at the end of episode 109, so we're just going to sort of jump right into it here today. Before we do that, two quick book reviews. Um, The first one, it's not really chronological, so to speak, Um, but I came across it in the research I was doing for Monroe. I, I came across this. I didn't know anything about it, and and then I sort of felt foolish for not knowing about it, so I went back and spent time reading um, some of it. But John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall, wrote a biography of George Washington right after Washington passed away, and it's seven volumes, and it's called The Life of George Washington. And uh, I read volume number seven, and it was fascinating. It was really good. So if you are a huge GW fan... Um, I would recommend that you check out The Life of George Washington by John Marshall. Maybe check out which volume you think you might be most interested in if you don't want to you know, buy all seven of them. But uh, incredibly in-depth, and it was written right after Washington's de- death. So it was written you know, while everything was still fresh and from a perspective of someone who, who actually saw his presence and his effect on people, which I, I find fascinating. The second one is... Um, more with with the theme of today's podcast, and that is uh, about James Monroe. And it is by Harlow Unger, and it's titled The Last Founding Father, James Monroe and a Nation's Call to Greatness. Um, it's really good. It's, it's a book that I've relied on for some of the information in this episode and, and, of course, moving forward. So I'll put them both up on the website, and you can check them out if you would like. By the way, thanks for your patience with the unit reviews. I know it can be frustrating you, you want to hear the narrative continue and uh, have to take a couple weeks off and review some of the stuff we already covered. I can understand could be really appreciated by some, but not so much by by others. And I get that. Um, in the end, I think taking a break and reflecting on much of what we have covered over the last few months is helpful to refresh our memory and get us into the right mindset as we continue. So I'll keep doing these unit reviews as we come to an end of a unit. Um, and I'm doing them knowing that, that maybe some of you would rather me keep moving forward. But I think in, in the long run, um, it is uh, helpful and uh, worthwhile. 
The last few episodes, we wrapped up the end of the War of 1812, talking about the Battle of New Orleans, Treaty of Ghent, and the Hartford Convention. On February 4th, 1815, James Madison received the letter he had been waiting for. Jackson had defeated the British. A week later, he found out about the Treaty of Ghent. Madison had been experiencing so much anxiety over both the negotiations in Ghent and the situation in New Orleans. The dark cloud that had been hanging over him his entire presidency was finally gone. Madison was more relieved than anything else. But his family, friends, and cabinet members, well, they were celebrating. They knew how big of a deal this was for both Madison's presidency and for the United States of America. Richard Rush, Madison's attorney general, told him that the news had come, quote, at the most happy point of time for our interest and our fame. Rush continued, explaining to Madison that, quote, Your anxious moment, sir, will now be fewer. Your labors abridged. Your friends more than ever gratified. The nation in your day advanced anew in prosperity and glory. The enthusiasm from Madison's colleagues wasn't just based on personally motivated observations, but also political ones. The Hartford Convention and the political unrest in New England had bothered Madison and the Democratic Republicans a lot. Madison and his colleagues knew that a victory in the War of 1812 was going to bolster them politically and put a lot of pressure on the Federalist troublemakers in New England who had been gaining momentum as the war dragged on. This end of the war would definitely be a political victory for the Democratic-Republican Party. And Madison knew it. But he was taking a more nationalistic view of this effort. He knew the USA was positioned not to only grow economically with the trade restrictions relieved, but also were in a position to earn international political respect, explaining to Rush, quote, The terms of peace will, I hope, be satisfactory to our country. With the events of the war, they cannot fail to command the respect of every other. When Madison sent the peace proposal to Congress, he made sure to publicly declare it a rousing success that America should be proud of. Of course, we know that this is ignoring many of the failures and challenges the war had presented, but politically, he knew that bringing the American people together behind this victory was his highest priority as president. And this is what makes leaders like Madison so valuable and critical in difficult times. Madison had been bearing the burden of this war for years, and he knew that his decades of personal sacrifice, or I should say, and professional sacrifice, to this nation would be tainted if he lost this war. No matter the outcome, his reputation was going to rise and fall with the outcome of the War of 1812. So when you hear Madison publicly declare that, quote, The war's success could be attributed to the wisdom of Congress, the patriotism of the American people, the public spirit of the militia, and the valor of the military and naval forces for the country, like he did when he was speaking about this to Congress. We all know that he was intentionally spreading the credit around. As Noah Feldman points out in his book on Madison, quote, Congress failed to give Madison the troops he needed. Most of the public had refused any sacrifice and avoided military service. The militia had frequently fled the field. The regular army had performed doubtfully at best. The Navy deserved some credit for American survival, but had not defended the eastern seaboard successfully. And even on the Great Lakes, it had never managed to achieve the genuine control that would have allowed for the easy conquest of Canada. But Madison's message and his spreading of the credit, even though Noah Feldman believes that that credit was not earned, is a symbol of selfless leadership. Knowing he would have likely taken all of the blame, in victory, Madison made sure to spread the credit to everyone involved. Leaders who approach situations always thinking about how they can take credit while dodging blame present the opposite traits that many of our founding fathers so graciously and tactfully displayed. 
In order to ensure that a war like this one would never happen again in the near future, Madison, with prodding from Monroe, asked Congress to maintain a regular army, grow the navy, and improve defenses, especially in harbors critical to American trade. This war had clearly changed Madison's view on international diplomacy. Remember, this was the guy who wanted to avoid conflict at all cost and genuinely believed that economic sanctions would keep them out of war. But with him seeing firsthand just how valuable military victory was, Madison now believed that being prepared for it at all times would be beneficial for the U.S. moving forward. But the quote-unquote victory in the War of 1812 wasn't James Madison's only lasting legacy from his presidency. As Madison looked toward the next two years of his presidency, he wanted to make sure that he put his stamp on the American presidency. As I've mentioned, Madison set the precedent of a moderately sized standing army, a change in approach from his original stance of a militia-based national defense. When it came to trade, Madison supported limited tariffs. He was a big fan of free trade, but knew that some tariffs would help to support future American manufacturing. Madison also explained that he was now open to a rechartering of the National Bank, something he was wholly opposed to when it was originally proposed by his rival, Alexander Hamilton. And this was an obvious one, one that Madison needed to explain. He justified this by noting that once the bank was established, everyone treated it like it was constitutional, accepted it in theory and practice, and had seen some benefit from it. This, in his mind, made it constitutional. Of course, this sets the precedent that the Constitution is a document that evolves over time with the nation's people and the changing landscape of our citizenry. But that didn't mean that he was as liberal in his interpretation of the federal government's power as someone like Alexander Hamilton. He still focused on Congress's enumerated powers and tried to limit its lawmaking influence when he could, going so far as vetoing an infrastructure bill passed by his own party because Congress didn't have the enumerated power to pass it in the first place. In December of 1816, Madison addressed the nation. He reflected on the upcoming 40th anniversary of the nation and the 25th anniversary of the Constitution, something that had passed during wartime. The anniversary passed during wartime, FYI, obviously not the Constitution (laughs) being ratified. Madison, having played a critical role in the writing of the Constitution, took time to reflect on the generation of Americans that at this point had lived through a constitutional United States and reminded everyone how his presidency upheld the spirit of the document. During the war, Madison ensured that, unlike uh, John Adams, by the way, He ensured that free speech and free assembly had been granted to his political enemies in New England. Madison wrote the document specifically to ensure liberty and freedom for the American people. When Adams had threatened that in the quasi-war with France, Madison and Jefferson spoke out against it publicly in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Now, with Madison in charge and the nation at war, He made sure he didn't just talk the talk, but he was willing to walk the walk. And this is something politicians don't often do. And this is is a sign of a really good leader, right? Someone who doesn't just do it because it's convenient, but they do it because they believe it's right. Madison then reflected on the challenges of declaring war with Britain. He reminded the American people that the Constitution did not just allow a president to send his nation to war unilaterally or behind the wave of public pressure like what happened so often in Europe. The balance of power was critically important to ensure the right decision was being made. At the same time, though, Madison also reflected on how important the outspoken opposition to his war was to the lasting success of the nation. It was important that people spoke out publicly about their concerns when they believed a governmental decision was not in their best interest personally or politically. This helps to ensure and maintain long-term balance. And in the eyes of Madison and other founding fathers, this was being a great American. 
Also, if you recall, one of Madison's chief arguments in favor of the Constitution was that the larger the republic, the more it would be able to protect from the tyranny of the majority or minority. Madison reminded everyone that the nation was growing, bringing in new perspectives and political desires, new cultures, new languages. This only further reinforced the checks and balances the people would provide for each other naturally through this expansion, thus further preserving the liberty of each individual. Madison finalized his constitutional tribute by proclaiming that, quote, the American people were devoted to true liberty and to the Constitution. The great principles of the Constitution included a government which watches over the purity of elections, freedom of speech, and of the press, and the trial by jury. The Constitution prohibited, quote, encroachments and contracts between religion and state, and it protected, quote, the maxims of public faith, the payment of government debts, and the security of persons and property. Finally, when referring to the role of the Constitution in international affairs, Madison proclaimed that the government under the Constitution would, quote, avoid intrusions on the internal repose of other nations and do justice to all other countries while requiring justice from them. Madison, in his heart of hearts, was damn proud of the Constitution. He believed that, if adhered to, it would create domestic peace and prosperity. Over time, that was spread to other nations around the world, making the Constitution's lasting impact almost immeasurable. Throughout the narrative of the War of 1812, and so far in this episode, we've spent a lot of time talking about James Madison, and rightfully so. But as we move forward into the next phase of America's history, it will be his most trusted advisor and friend, James Monroe, who will take center stage. And I know some historians will nitpick and say, no, his most trusted advisor was Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, I get that. I'm talking about like in 1816, it was James Monroe. But I think that a simple transition from President Madison to President Monroe in the election of 1816 isn't doing Monroe the justice that he deserves either. We've covered in a previous episode how Monroe had actively campaigned against Madison multiple times, failing each time. But looking at those failures in a vacuum would not only be a mistake, but also, I think, really sell Monroe short. He was an incredibly popular man in Virginia and nationally. His simultaneous six-month service as the Secretary of State and the Secretary of War not only made history, but obviously shows that he is very capable. And it underscores the trust that Madison and Congress had in his abilities, both personally and professionally. In the last year of the war, James Monroe really began to distinguish himself in the eyes of many. He sent John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, to Europe, giving him a lot of autonomy in creating a lasting peace with Britain. He was the one who ordered Jackson to New Orleans to defend the city from invasion, and the first to approach Congress with the idea to draft an army of 100,000 men and was one of the primary reasons why Congress eventually established the Second National Bank of the United States. His vision and his leadership eventually helped America to achieve a proud, quote, victory on the battlefield and a satisfactory victory at the negotiating table. But things were harder for Monroe the last year of the war than many people realized. Monroe worked all day, every day. He was stressed beyond belief and he took personal responsibility for the outcome of the war. At one point, he was stretched so thin that he ended up wearing the same outfit for 10 days in a row. When news of the Treaty of Ghent reached the desk of James Monroe, his relief was likely just as great as James Madison's. Some historians will argue that at this time, at the end of the war, for all intents and purposes, it was Monroe who had taken over as the commander-in-chief of the U.S. military, more than Madison. Monroe was the one with the resume that no one could ever dream of matching. He was the one that was directly responsible for the Department of War and State, and he was the one that had garnered more respect from Congress than anyone else, Madison included. After the war had ended, Monroe went home to be with his wife Elizabeth and his three children, 
who'd experienced both physical and mental illness during the war. After spending this time recuperating with his family, Monroe had regained his energy and passion for politics and was ready to get back at it. By the end of 1815, Monroe had informed his son-in-law, George Hay, that he was ready to run for president and wanted him to help him run his campaign. Hay was a capable professional, a former attorney and U.S. District Court judge, who was well known for leading the prosecutor's case against Aaron Burr years earlier. Monroe and Hay didn't have much doubt that the presidential election of 1816 was Monroe's to lose, but they still wanted to be thoughtful and intentional about how to approach it. Monroe's entire life had been building to this, and this, he was not going to let this slip away. And now he's not running against James Madison, right? So maybe he'll have a chance of winning. As the election of 1816 approached, the nation had experienced 16 years of Democratic-Republican rule, and some really didn't have much of an appetite for another four or even eight. Especially a third straight Democratic-Republican from the state of Virginia. As a side note, uh, these three consecutive eight-year terms of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe is often referred to as the Virginia dynasty, and, and sometimes that also includes Washington. Um, Because as you know, George Washington was also from Virginia. And so that means that the state of Virginia provided America with its president 32 of the first 36 years of our existence under the Constitution, which is really incredible to consider. Anyways, like I said, though, not everyone was behind Monroe as the nominee. New York supported Daniel Tompkins, while some in the South and the West supported William Crawford. Is their nominee. And Crawford was the real competition to Monroe within the Democratic Republican Party. He had served as a state senator, the U.S. Minister to France during the war, and Secretary of War after Monroe. But Crawford also knew that when it was all said and done and the dust had settled, the likely winner of the Democratic Republican nomination was probably going to be James Monroe. And as we have seen play out in our own politics, um, still today, uh, the last thing you want to do is get on the bad side of the future president of the United States. So Crawford withdrew his name from consideration, helping Monroe secure the nomination, which was the right move because, coincidentally, Crawford was made Secretary of the Treasury after Monroe eventually won the presidency. But, I mean, this was close. This nomination within the Democratic-Republican Party was close. And if Crawford had not withdrawn, it may have been even closer like seriously threatening Monroe's opportunity. But having won the nomination from the Democratic-Republican Party, Monroe had all but wrapped up the presidency. The Federalist Party nominated Rufus King, but with the loud and public opposition to the war and the embarrassment of the Hartford Convention, any Federalist candidate had a snowball's chance in hell of beating James Monroe. And they knew it. And so did Monroe. The Democratic-Republicans had won the War of 1812, Now it was time to cash in. Neither King nor Monroe did any campaigning in this election because it, well, would have been a waste of time. The war was won, people were moving west, and the economy was booming. Heck, even if King wanted to campaign, what was he supposed to say? There's nothing to criticize. Monroe won an overwhelming victory in the election, 183 to 34 electoral votes. Daniel Tompkins of New York won the vice presidential seat. And this was a big deal. James Monroe became the fifth president of the United States, but more notably to many, he was the first Revolutionary War hero to serve as president since George Washington. Also, as I mentioned earlier, Monroe was viewed by many as the man who orchestrated the military and diplomatic victory over the British in the War of 1812 even though those are both arguably oversimplified perspectives and conclusions. No matter, though, Monroe was the last of the Founding Fathers to serve as president and will usher in a decade of prosperity and national unity and political and social congruence that the nation had never experienced. Monroe gave his inaugural address on March 4, 1817, to a large crowd of veterans, politicians, and citizens alike. In his speech, 
Monroe focused on a few different priorities he would have as president, such as strengthening the nation's defenses, unifying its people, and expanding the economy through manufacturing and infrastructure. Like Madison, Monroe learned his lesson from the war and wanted to make sure the U.S. would be ready if faced with another international conflict, explaining that he wanted to, quote, put our extensive coast in such a state of defense as to secure our cities and interior from invasion. National honor is national property of the highest value. It ought, therefore, to be cherished. Lastly, having been disturbed by the Hartford Convention and foreshadowing the upcoming harmony in the United States, Monroe, like Washington and Jefferson before him, made sure to take the time to focus on political, social, and national unity, declaring, quote, Discord does not belong to our system. The American people constitute one great family with a common interest. And as a quick aside, um, the book that I mentioned that John Marshall wrote, right, The Life of George Washington, Monroe read this book, and he read specifically volume seven, which talked about George Washington's presidency and how he was able to juggle the competing factions that were growing in the United States. See, James Monroe had grown up with John Marshall. They were very close in childhood. They went to the same school, the same college. They fought together in the war. They actually bunked with each other at Valley Forge. Then they both studied law. Then they both studied politics. So they had a lot in common. And being a Virginian, a former Continental soldier, Uh, Marshall and Monroe both had an affinity for George Washington. Monroe learned a lot from reading about George Washington. He read it while he was vacationing with his family following the news of the Treaty of Ghent. Marshall's interpretation of Washington's leadership inspired Monroe, and Monroe wanted to do everything he could to emulate the great general, the American Cincinnatus. As we talk more about Monroe's leadership over the next eight years, don't be surprised if you see some parallels between Washington and Monroe's leadership styles. As you pack up your things, I'd like you to momentarily put aside your enthusiasm for President Monroe and reflect on the accomplishments of James Madison. Following his presidency, like I mentioned in the intro, Madison required quietly to his home, near Jefferson at Montpelier. He did help Jefferson establish the University of Virginia, and quietly advise some of his friends and allies who found themselves in the forefront of American politics. But outside of that, nationally, you have never really heard much from James Madison again. Madison has served as a colonel in the American Revolution, meaning that his retirement came after 40 years of professional service to the United States. He served as a delegate to the Confederation Congress, and worked to organize the Annapolis and Philadelphia conventions. He helped to write the Constitution. Heck, it was really his brainchild. He convinced thousands of Americans of the value it would bring to our nation, and after his ratification, he was elected to the Virginia House of Representatives, all before his 40th birthday. Madison then worked with Jefferson to fight against what they believed to be an overreach of federal power with Hamilton's High Federalist. He established the Democratic-Republican Party with Jefferson, served as Jefferson's Secretary of State, and as president, he helped America survive another war with Britain. James Madison was short, frail, soft-spoken, and physically weak. In a time when physical stature was really, really important, Madison had the cards stacked against him. But time and time again, the words that came out of his mouth, even if delivered in a quiet and unassuming tone, overcame any initial perceptions people had about his competency or his genius. James Madison was not perfect in his various political roles, and there were times when he was overwhelmed and, in retrospect, likely made the wrong decision. But James Madison was an American hero. One could argue that he was the most influential American when reflecting on the creation of the constitutional United States we know and love today. When we casually reflect back on American history and the Founding Fathers, names like Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and especially recently, Hamilton, usually pop into people's minds. Maybe with a story here and there about Paul Revere and uh, 
uh, the loud, obnoxious Patrick Henry. But don't forget about the diminutive James Madison. He deserves a lot more recognition than people often give him. And honestly, I'm going to miss studying him and learning more about him as we move forward in this podcast. Thanks for listening. And hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. Class dismissed.